talking about. Oh, thank you, Carol. You're fun. welcome. <laughs> so yeah, everybody will get the recording once this is done. So rites of passage and its relationship to uh, remembering, and as some folks like to say, remembering uh, the gift that we have to offer. And so I moved in this moment to share a practice that I have learned um, at least through a couple of First Nation tribes on this continent. And I have found a similar practice in other areas of the world, often with, uh, I would say, First Nations peoples or tribal peoples or indigenous peoples that have a palpable and distinct relationship with ancestors. Seems to be a, an, uh, a necessary part of uh, arriving at this, this particular practice that I'm going to share with you. And not just as a conceptual idea, but from the perspective that ancestors are part of our community. Um, so in, in modern society, if, if I get kind of in modern society, we may look at things this way, that we're born into this, into our village, so to speak, our families, our communities, our society, our culture. <clears throat> and very quickly, depending on where we are, uh, our aptitude and our interests begin to be measured and observed and noticed. And then, um, and then we go, th go through school and we are uh, taught certain things that have to do with the values of the culture or society that we're in. The thing the cultures and societies or modern societies value are the things that we teach. <clears throat> and so as going through school, we learn these, these particular values, these uh, what I would call uh, the mythologies of a modern uh, society. I don't know if I would call it a culture sometimes, but the mythologies of a modern society and those mythologies are based on what the society values. Um, and often, as I, as I wrote in a little blurb for this for this particular gathering, um, that what our what our at least what our modern society values a lot here in the West uh, is filled with isms, all kinds of isms, and you, we can just go down the list of of isms and name all these different ones. And I mentioned that these, these isms have a lot less to do with you personally and what you came into this world to offer than it does with what the, what the society wants from you. If you happen to match up with that, that's great. But if you don't, then it can be challenging. <clears throat> and so we begin to navigate our way into uh, some awareness of our own identity and the way we belong to a, to community to ourselves within our own skin um, against this this backdrop of uh, information and, and, and education. Um, and uh, I always like to note that the word education comes originally from the word educare. It's a Latin word. It means to pull out of or to draw forth from within. Uh, so that understanding that what one uh, has to offer has less to do with what is put in you in terms of information and more to do with what is drawn out of you. <clears throat> so now back to uh, a practice that I've seen in many, many places around the world and, and certain tribal traditions in this country. And that is this understanding that uh, Contrary to what I just said, that you come into this world carrying a gift. And you also possess the, uh, a certain degree of personal power that is necessary to deliver this gift before you leave and join your ancestors once again. <clears throat> and so that coming here, they would say in these ancient cultures, typically as a matter of choice, it would be that you look down 
here or looked over here or across here and you said they really need this particular medicine and I wish to bring it and then you look around the realm of your ancestors the healthy ones by the way and you you say and you and you and you and you also carry this gift so I'll need your help when I get there and so we then we come here <clears throat> and the practice that I found is that in a lot of cultures a short time after one arrives in their community they will go to live with a, an elder or a grandparent and um, for the purpose of receiving a specific type of name I call it a medicine name different maybe than the one uh, that they had already been given sometimes it's the only name <clears throat> and within this name there are certain uh, descriptors of the the gift and the medicine that the elder sees in this little one for instance uh, I was working with a 17 year old um, boy one time in a wilderness rehab center meaning that uh, he ended up there because he turned down the wrong road of initiation and uh, the road where young people initiate themselves through uh, dangerous behavior and violence and reckless actions and um, and so he was in front of me in this wilderness rehab and what I knew about him is that he had actually been born in a village in South Africa um, and he moved to this country when he was eight and to Washington DC so you can immediately see the 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 paradigm shift that this this child is going to have to reconfigure and uh, so I asked him I said I knew something about the practices there and I said uh, uh, we'll just call him Jimmy I said Jimmy do you have another name and he looked at me really curiously and he said yeah I do tell me about that I said and uh, he said well when I was uh, little I went to uh, live with my my grandmother I think called her Goji and uh, for a while and while I was with her um, she gave me this other name I said well you write it down for me so he wrote down this long name and uh, and I said read it and so what he read to me were uh, elements like water or fire or earth or mineral animals features in the landscape um, and then he paused and he looked uh, tearful and he and he looked off to the side and he said uh, you know I remember before I left the village um, I was sitting with my grandmother and she said remember to follow your name and I said have you been doing that and he said no and uh, so this understanding that this name and I've seen that practice in other other traditions this name that was gifted given or seen in him or in her and some other situations that I've witnessed um, had embedded within it the the frequency of the gift and the medicine that the elder saw in them as a, as a small child and the idea that they follow this name that they live into it so gift uh, when I say medicine I mean that which we're born with that what we came into this world to offer to deliver um, and, and who we are is uh, is um, comes essentially from the realm of the ancestors but is blueprinted by uh, the place and the time and, and uh, the ancestral lineages that we come in uh, through and, and when and where and so this is what I call our our uh, our blueprint so what does this have to do with rites of passage um, well the let's say rites of passage is a way of assisting um, 
people within the community to navigate the territory of uh, difficult changes. We could say initiatory descents of soul, dark nights of the soul. Could be developmental, could be uh, intentional and conscious and, and chosen or accidental. Um, but there are these periods of threshold and change uh, that are quite challenging that require an initiatory uh, passage. And um, so a rite of passage involves a period of severance where we're, we're letting go and severing from that which was. And a period of threshold, this one, the betwixt and between time. It's when Muhammad was up on the mountain. It's when Jesus was in the desert. It's when Buddha went into the Bodhi tree. It's this period where one is uh, mentored and prepared to go into this threshold phase in wilderness uh, to fast, uh, to pray, um, and the way that I like to say it, to remember. To remember those agreements they had made with their ancestors before coming here about who they were coming here to be and what they were coming here to offer. So these things are remembered. In, in Africa, I once heard it said that all, that all true learning is simply remembering. Uh, it's, it's something that's coming out of us. So this gift um, of remembering is activated often by these initiatory rites of passage um, where we're, uh, again, guided by an initiated elder um, through a process of preparation to examine what, is, uh, what, the, what has come before us and prepares us for this threshold period. And then there's a return where we come back. Um, so it has many names. Um, on this continent, uh, a, a common name or a popular name um, called vision quest ceremony or prayer fasting or hill walking like they might say in the British Isles. This way of going out uh, into the wilderness to fast and pray and remember. Um, but it's not simply remembering. Um, because we don't live in uh, those unbroken lineages of uh, connection to ritual and ceremony and ancestors the way that, you know, if we go far enough behind us, we would eventually run into that type of reality. But we don't live in that world for the most part. Most of us don't. Um, so there's this process of not simply remembering um, but I like to call the, the three braids of sweetgrass. Um, when you look at a piece of sweetgrass, you see that it has three braids. Think of one of these braids as healing. Think of one of these braids as remembering. And think of one of these braids as belonging. So when one goes into the initiatory passage, it's often activated uh, by difficulty. Uh, matter of fact, uh, most great journeys begin in darkness, begin in challenge, begin with, I don't know what to do. Um, and so these periods of darkness or challenge are what I call the seeding grounds of the great journey. Um, now it's true that I don't, I'm not of the school of thought that uh, refers to anything that is challenging as an initiation. Um, I think things can be challenging and we can live a, a repetitive existence of challenging experiences because we haven't been able to access the teachings or the lessons that are offered up by these experiences. Um, an initiation uh, means that one thing has ended and something else now begins. Um, and that can happen uh, through difficult passages, but it's not guaranteed. Um, so the, the gift of remembering often involves healing. 
and healing those places in ourselves that we have disconnected from. So I want to share a teaching with you from uh, a wonderful uh, anthropologist storyteller uh, that I got the privilege of spending some time with, gosh, I don't know how many, 1988, named Angelus Arian. And uh, I have, uh, as, as all good storytellers, of course, I've embellished, uh, embellished the story just enough to, to have it arc through me, but kept to the original plot line. <laughs> so I want you to imagine this. If you had grown up in one of these ancient villages a long, long time ago, in a place older than the pine needles on the trees, and in a place far, far from here. So far from here, it was further east than the sun and further west than the moon. And if you grew up in that place in that time and in that village, and you had gone to see the old medicine man or old medicine woman of your village, because you were feeling dispirited in some way. <clears throat> you might sit with them in a sweat lodge or around the fire or in their lodge. <clears throat> and as you sat with this old medicine, old medicine person, they would consider that there could only be a few things going on with you that were creating this sense of dispiritedness. And one of the things they would consider as they listened to your story they would consider that possibly at some time in your life or another life, you had witnessed or experienced something so tragic that part of your spirit simply left and that the healing antidote would be to sing your spirit back home, call your spirit back home. The other thing this old medicine man or old medicine woman might consider could be going on with you as you are sharing your own story of dispiritedness would be that possibly at some time in your life or another life, <clears throat> you had disconnected from the gift of medicine that you came into this world to deliver and that the uh, and you had not been able to find a process of being initiated into the bone memory or the mythology of your own life, and thus were adopting and following the mythologies of a modern society or something devoid of spiritual ground. <clears throat> and so the healing antidote in a situation like this would be lining you back up with this gift of medicine that you carry, helping you remember through initiatory rites of passages uh, the gift that you carry, the gift that you came into this world to deliver. The other thing the old medicine man or old medicine woman would be considered would be going on with you in this time of dispiritedness would be that at some time in your life or another life, you had attached yourself to some energy or some energy had attached itself to you and that attachment was draining your life force. And that the healing antidote would require severing those fear-based cords of attachment and returning that, that power, that life energy back to you. Maybe in the form of a, a spirit animal that had been you had lost relationship with or an ancestral helping spirit. <clears throat> and then the fourth thing this old medicine man or old medicine woman would be considered might be going on with you and contributing to the state of uh, dispiritedness would be that at some time in your life or another life you had forgotten or your people before you had forgotten the practices of gratitude, the practices of uh, connecting with the ancestors, the practices of knowing your relationship to all of creation and being part of that creation, the practices of the uh, 
rites and rituals and ceremonies of engagement that kept one alive and connected. And a healing antidote would then be to restore these relationships, these ancient practices, ceremonies, and rituals. I want to share a quote from you, with you um, uh, from uh, Wendell Berry. He says, I received a letter containing an account of a recent suicide. My friend jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge two months ago. She had been terribly depressed for years and there was no help for her, at least none that she could find that was sufficient. She was trying to get from one phase of her life to another and couldn't make it. She had been ter terribly wounded as a child and the wound had not been healed and she destroyed herself. The letter had already asked, how does a human pass through life without breaking down? And it also had answered with help from tradition through ceremonies and rituals and rites of passage at the most difficult stages. So that's from uh, Wendell Berry. It's an excerpt from a, a book he wrote a good while back called The Unsettling of America. So it speaks to this, this challenge, this dilemma of um, finding identity and, and healing and belonging um, in, in a way that uh, uh, that inspires and, and activates inspiration and, and purpose living, purposeful living and sense of direction. And so rites of passage are those uh, processes um, that can occur in a, a person's life really at any time really. Um, although they often get thought of as one of these uh, uh, passages that is designated from adolescent to adulthood. Um, but since we <laughs> happen to live in a society, at least over here in this country, where uh, what we call an adolescent society, um, we have many people in need of rites of passage uh, at 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or whatever age. Um, having never bridged that transition. Um, it, it's a, a small, those of you in the, in, on the, uh, in the gallery there that are familiar with me going down rabbit holes, this is just a small one. But I always say that. So um, when I think about that whole adolescent society and I think about this, this uh, much needed rise of the, what I call rise of the rooted feminine energy uh, in consciousness and, and, and showing up in uh, all the various systems and, and systemic areas that, that need that energy. I notice uh, often that there's not really a, another variation of understanding for masculine other than patriarchy. And yet uh, there is so much more. It's what I call the, there is what I refer to as the uninitiated feminine and uninitiated masculine, and the initiated feminine and the initiated masculine. These are two variations of, of those that have uh, shifted uh, and made that crossing. Um, and, uh, and it's not always a crossing that is, is guaranteed. In ancient cultures, your survival during such a crossing wasn't, wasn't a guarantee. Um, Nowadays, we have initiatory rites of passage and wilderness prayer fasts and, and things where the, for the most part, uh, the risk is perceived, which is useful enough, um, even though there is still real risk in the initiatory passage. But it is this, uh, this severance from uh, this old way of being, the old story, into this new way of being. The last uh, uh, prayer fast vision quest that I went on personally, um, I had uh, done this ritual on the last night. I call it, I call it a death lodge ritual. 
Death Lodge is one of those terms that's often used in, in conjunction with rites of passage or vision quest uh, information. And, uh, and it has to do with uh, the initiatory passage, as I like to say, runs opposite the flow of life. You know, we think of life as beginning at birth and ending over here at death, at least in this one lifetime and lifeline. Um, and so it flows like this. But the initiatory passage begins with death and runs the other way and flows toward life. So that's why we have this term death lodge at the beginning and as the part of that preparation for the initiatory journey, we go to the death lodge, the place where we put down what needs to be put down, where we uh, pick up what needs to be picked up, where we uh, close out any, any chapter that we feel complete with, where we let go of the old stories that we've been telling ourselves about ourselves that are no longer useful. Um, so in such a ceremony, I had gone out for four days and nights. Um, and on that last night, I had, uh, it was in the uh, uh, Capitol Reef National Park out in Utah, uh, down in this uh, dry riverbed. And on the last night, I had prepared to, uh, to sit up all night with fire. So I gathered, gathered my wood and, uh, <clears throat> and then made a fire circle. And across the fire, I had put uh, a seat, a log. And uh, as a, a, an invitation. And then as the, uh, in the sand, in this dry riverbed, I had uh, gotten a branch from an old juniper tree and I had etched the symbols of the story of my life up until this very night. All the most important uh, parts of my life that have been part of my story um, that I had, that got me here, that got me to this fire. Um, and then I, uh, lit the fire and spoke an invocation and called on my ancestors uh, to come witness. And, uh, and we always say, when you call your ancestors to the fire, you can imagine these ancient ones showing up and saying, you know, grandson, granddaughter, what brings you to this fire? And in truth, what brings you to the fire is your life. Everything up until this moment brings you to this fire. So I had etched it in the sand beside me and I lit the fire and started the fire and spoke my invocation. And, uh, and then I spoke out to, to creation uh, that my death lodge was open and anyone uh, living or non-living, human or non-human, that needed to come and spend time with me at this fire uh, to, to finish whatever needed to be finished um, so that I could uh, step into the sunrise the next day um, into a new life, uh, they were welcome to come. At that moment, if you do this ritual, at that moment, you don't start thinking about who you need to kind of go out there and drag to your fire. <laughs> you just tend fire. And the, the trick to, this is a little logistical piece, the trick to staying all, up all night with a fire is use little sticks because you have to keep feeding the fire. <laughs> So I'm feeding the fire. I've sent an invitation out and I stop thinking about it. I don't even think about who's going to show up and sit there in front of me. But several did. Some were no surprise. Some were completely unexpected. And when they showed up at my fire, I listened to see what they needed to say to me. And I spoke what I needed to say to them when we were complete. And there's a sense of that energy was gone. So this went on all night. Sometimes there are hours of silence. Sometimes there are hours of busyness and conversation. And, then, and after each one left, I went back to tending fire. As the morning rose the following, uh, on sunrise on the fifth morning of my quest, um, I let the fire burn down to ash. And, uh, and then I stepped into the ash, and I took the ash and I put it over my body. Um, and then I turned and faced east toward the rising sun. And I'd already put all my gear a few paces toward the rising sun. 
And so I offered my gratitude for the stories that brought me here. Um, and I stepped out of the ashes of my old life and not looking back, put, picked up my, my gear and walked toward the rising sun. So that's a, a form of a, of a death lodge. What came to me in that whole quest um, was about writing um, the next part of my life. Um, it has to do with the book I'm working on at the moment. Um, and in different quests, different things have come. My very first quest I did almost 30 years ago, um, I got the message um, that came to me in a grief, I call it a, a spontaneous grief ritual, uh, where on the third day of fasting, um, I found myself uh, crying and crying and crying. And all I could say were the words, bring the people home, bring the people home, bring the people home. This was out in uh, California in the Sierra Nevada mountains and in that high desert. And that chant of bring the people home evolved into 30 years of creating and working with uh, offering rites of passage work. I had no idea what it meant back then. I thought it was some silly school reunion I was supposed to do <laughs> 30 years ago. Um, but it activated the memory of the gift um, that I came into this world to offer. And so um, I think at these different passages of our lives, these activations, you know, set the, the new name in place. And so we follow, we, we, we walk towards that new name um, and live into it. And um, <clears throat> so I wanted to uh, pause and offer you a story. Actually, I actually have a couple of stories. Um, this story uh, comes to me by way of Stephen Foster and Meredith Little in 1994, uh, the ones I apprenticed with in learning the, uh, the ceremony of the Vision Quest back then. And, uh, and it comes to them from a, an, uh, an anonymous uh, First Nations people, person, that did not wish to be named. Um, and uh, over the 30 years, I have, uh, as I say, I've, I've held true to the, to the plot, but I have embellished quite a bit. So um, I'd like to share this story with you called Singing Stone. So let's see if I can. Um... And if you, uh, in the top right-hand corner, if you click View and you go to Speaker, you'll see a better, a more fuller image. And one of Pull this back, uh, just my screen. Let's see if I can bring this drum up here a little bit in front of me. <clears throat> okay. So we're gonna do a little test here. So I'm not how sure that sound will come out, but as I'm drumming, can you hear me clearly? Since I am on, um, Carol, yeah, I can see you. I'm actually on um, speaker view, so I'm kind of staring at myself. So I'm going to uh, switch mine back to gallery view so I can see all of your beautiful faces. And uh, if you wish to do speaker view, you'll see me. So as we say, once upon a time, Or once below a time, or once sitting by a fire somewhere on an online village <laughs> in a place that is not even in time, there was a village. And as we said earlier, this village existed a long, long time ago in a place older than the pine needles on the trees, in a place far, far from here, further west than the moon, and further east than the sun. And in that place and in that time, there was a village. And in that village, 
there was a circle of warriors standing shoulder to shoulder facing outwards around the lodge. And within that lodge there sat a circle of grandmothers facing inwards. And within that circle of grandmothers was a woman bringing life, new life, into her village. And outside this lodge could be heard sounds of singing and rattling and prayers of gratitude to the ancestors. Prayers of gratitude for this new life coming into the village. For they knew that this new life was bringing some very important medicine, a sacred dance, a holy language, an elixir to quench deep thirst. This little one was bringing medicine to the village and they all knew that's why they were coming. See, that's why they all come. And soon outside the walls of that lodge emanating from beyond the circle of warriors encircling that lodge could be heard sounds of deep breathing and grunting and sometimes screaming the way you hear those sounds of deep breathing, grunting and screaming when a woman is bringing new life into her village. And as lightning touched the ground beside that lodge, the sounds of that infant child could be heard. The cries of that infant child could be heard. Now this infant child, having just arrived here in this village, wanted to speak about why they had come, wanted to share about this, this important gift that they had brought. And they, when they opened their mouth, all that came out were these cries. And so they knew they would need to wait and learn the language of their people before they spoke about this gift that they had brought to the village. Well, having one foot in that world over there and now one foot in this world over here began, it began to become a little challenging to hold on, to keep both feet planted firmly in both worlds. And so they made the decision to plant both feet in this world, in this village in this time and in this place. And as they did so, there slowly began to be a disconnection from the agreements, from the memories of the agreements they had made with their ancestors about what they were coming here to offer. They began to forget about those alliances and connections to those ancestral helping spirits that also carried that same medicine that we're going to assist them in this work. Usually happens around four or five, they say. When children begin to become conditioned into this physical, modern reality in terms of what is possible. Before that time, they seem to have a pretty good foot anchored in both worlds. If you ever listen to children that are three or four years old, they will tell you the most amazing things about that other place. Well, this child planted both feet in this village and the forgetting began to happen. It began to set in. And with this forgetting, there settled into their spirit a loneliness, a bit of a confusion of identity and belonging. And as they grew up in this village, they would often find themselves sitting around those council fires late into the evening, listening to the elders tell stories. And time and time again, they would hear this story the elders would share about this time of the singing of stone. And when the elders spoke of this time, they noticed that the elders had a tearfulness, a longing in their eyes, both of gratitude and of hope. It was a time when there was much respect in the village, respect between the men and the men and the men and the women and the men and women and the others, and honor. 
There is awareness and connection to the realm of the ancestors. There was gratitude and there was respect. Well, this child eventually grew to that place of betwixt in between, you know, you remember when it happened, right? Around 14? That place of betwixt in between when you're no longer where you were, but you're not yet where you're heading. Yeah, 14, or maybe it was 24, or 34, or 44, or 54, or 64, or 74, 84, you know that place, betwixt and between. Well, they had grown to that place and they noticed, maybe they noticed it for the first time, having not seen it before, but there seemed to be a dark cloud that descended upon the village. And with that dark cloud, there seemed to be a whole lot of forgetting. And with that forgetting, there seemed to be a, this low-level anxiety, depression, that settled in the people's spirits, a flatness, sometimes a grief that became so petrified it turned into anger. Well, they noticed this dark cloud having descended on the village and they noticed the impact that it was having. So they went to their grandmother and grandfather and they said, Grandmother, Grandfather, I would like to go find this singing stone that I have heard you speak of and bring it back to the village. It seems to be what this village needs. And they said, Yes, Granddaughter, it is time for you to go. We first want you to go to your mother's lodge and ask for her blessing, go to your father's lodge and ask for his blessing, and return here to this fire. So she went to her mother's lodge and told her about this journey, this quest, to find the singing stone and return it to the village. And her mother walked to the back of the lodge and returned with a medicine blanket that she unfolded. Within that medicine blanket was an ancient ancestral bow. And she took the bow out of its blanket and gifted it to her daughter along with her blessing. And as her daughter left that lodge, her mother wept for she knew she would never ever see this child again. And then he went to his father's lodge and he told his father of this great journey to find the singing stone. And his father walked to the back of the lodge and came out with a medicine blanket in which he unfolded. And within that medicine blanket was one ancient ancestral arrow. And he gifted his son with this arrow. And with that arrow, his blessing. And his son, as his son left that lodge, his father wept, for he knew he would never, ever see this child again. He returned to his grandmother and grandfather's fire, and they said, Now, granddaughter, tonight you will go into the prayer lodge, into the Anipi lodge, and the purification lodge, to pray for the blessing of your ancestors for this journey. And so she went into that lodge. And over those hot stones and in that dark, moist mist, she cried and sang and prayed and prayed and cried and sang. So she felt the blessing of her ancestors descend upon her for this journey, for this quest. And then she returned to her grandmother and grandfather's fire. And they said, Granddaughter, first light you are to lead this village into the east. And do not look back, for there will be no fanfare for your departure, for they will likely not even notice. But know this, granddaughter. We believe in you, and we are standing by you. And if you listen to the wisdom that moves across this land, down these rivers and through these valleys, you may find something out there to bring back to your people. So 
at first light, she left the village into the east, into the rising sun, into the fresh dew on the grass, the pale greens and yellows of spring. And there, some distance in the east, she saw Eagle. And walking over to Eagle, she made offerings before she spoke, as was the custom of her people. Making these offerings, she said, Eagle, can you tell me where I can find this singing stone that my elders have spoken of? And Eagle said, Granddaughter, I cannot tell you where to find this one that you look for, but I will tell you this. We have been watching you very closely since you arrived in that village. And we believe in you, and we are standing by you. And if you continue to listen to the wisdom that moves across this land, through these trees and woods, down these rivers, you may find something out here. And I suggest you turn and go into the south and see what is there for you. So with this, she thanked Eagle for this guidance. And he turned into the south. He turned into the noonday sun. He turned into the deep, dark, green vegetation of summer kind of south. And there, some distance in the south, you saw a coyote. He walking over to Coyote and making offerings, as was the custom of his people. He spoke and said, Coyote, can you tell me where I might find this singing stone that my elders have spoken of around those council fires late at night? And Coyote said, Grandson, I cannot tell you where to find this one that you look for, but I will tell you this. We have been watching you since you arrived, and we believe in you, and we are standing by you. And if you continue to listen to the wisdom that echoes from these mountains and across this land that rises up from the very ground out here, you may find something to take back to your village. And I suggest you turn and go into the west see what is there for you. So with this, he thanked Coyote for this guidance. And she turned into the west. She turned into the setting sun, into the cooler, crisper nights of autumn, into the bright colored leaves overhead and on the ground kind of west. And there's some distance in the west by a river. She saw a bear. And making her offerings to bear, she made her request, Bear, can you tell me where I can find the singing stone that my elders have spoken of? And bear said, Granddaughter, I cannot tell you where to find this one that you look for. But I will tell you this. We have been watching you very closely, and we believe in you and the medicine that you carry. <clears throat> and we are standing by you, and I suggest, well, I cannot tell you where to look, that you turn into the north and see what is there for you. So she thanked Bear for this guidance. He turned into the north. He turned into the dark, cold, crisp, clear, deep snow kind of north. And there's some great distance into the north. He saw what looked like steam. Behind that steam, big nostrils. Behind those big nostrils, a great buffalo. And going over to this great being, he said, accept these offerings, great one. Can you tell me 
where I can find the singing stone. For I am weary and I'm tired. And I don't know where to look anymore. I've searched the four corners of our land. Can you tell me where I can find this one? And the great buffalo said, Grandson, I have heard of this one that you speak of. For my elders and ancestors have told a similar story. However, I cannot tell you where to find it. But I will tell you this. If you go up on that mountain over there, that one over there in the center of the wheel, and pray to the spirit of that mountain, to your ancestors, you may find something. And know that we are believing in you and we are standing by you. So thanking Buffalo for this guidance, she went on to that mountain. She went up the sacred mountain and made her prayer circle of stones and offered her prayer ties to the four directions, encircling her. And for four days and four nights, she sang and prayed cried and cried and sang and prayed. And on that fifth morning, she had received the guidance that she should return to her village. While she did not understand this guidance, she did trust that this was true and clear. So she made her offerings of gratitude to the spirit of the mountain and to her ancestors. And she began to make her way back toward that village, the way you make your way back toward a village when you've been on a long journey trying to remember something that has been forgotten or something that has been stolen or something that has not been acknowledged. And it was a long journey back to her village. It was the wee hours of the morning, sun rising over the village. She became along the, the river that flowed by the village as she walked upstream. And as the early morning hours, she could hear sounds she could hear sounds traveling across the top of the water, about a foot off, the way sounds do travel across rivers for a long distance. Sometimes feel it sound like they're just around the corner, and they could be a mile or two up. Voices, sounds, she could hear them on the water. And as she journeyed, she eventually came to the turning in the trail toward her village, and as she looked toward the village, she saw all the people of her village standing on both sides of the, of the trail, waving, smiling, say they were saying something, she couldn't make it out. And finally, she got close enough that what they were saying found her ears, and she could now hear what they were saying. Welcome home, singing stone. Welcome home, Singing Stone. That night, Singing Stone had a dream. Singing Stone dreamed she was sitting by a council fire, much like that one on our screen here. Sitting by a council fire, and around that council fire sat Eagle, Coyote, bear, and buffalo. She said, I want to thank you for believing in me, and I want to thank you for standing by me and showing me the way. And 
buffalo stepped forward into the firelight and said, Granddaughter, grandson, do not think as with your words, but let the way in which you live your life speak your thanks, and this we will see. You go well, singing stone. Go well. Oh. Get in a little closer here and see everybody. Switch back to. You get too close, I can't see. I have to have a assisted viewing here. So the gift is within, and it's the the journey itself is what confirms the gift. There are no there are no destinations or acquisitions, as I like to say. No place to arrive at, nothing to get that finally confirms uh, that you have arrived somewhere or you have acquired that which you needed. Um, those are just distractions of a modern society. It's the journey. And the journeys often begin with difficulty, challenge, uncertainty. Um, because it, what's, it's, it's, it's in that dark night or that difficulty or that challenge or that unknowing that uh, carries us to the edge of uh, venturing out of the familiar, like, like uh, Singing Stone, leaving the village. Leaving the village could mean putting down some old story that you have about yourself or that you, and you've trapped yourself in this old story and you can't get out and you finally decide I'm done. As a, as a teacher of mine once said to me, and some of you that know this teacher of mine will laugh when you hear this, I was going through a particular dark night uh, following a, um, that lasted a couple of years and uh, following a, um, a divorce. And um, I was in the process of telling the story, you know, again. And, uh, and my teacher, Rocking Bear, said to me, said, uh, how do you feel when you tell that story? I said, I feel like shit. I don't like <laughs> he said, are, um, are, you, are you not tired of telling that story? Because I'm kind of tired of hearing it. <laughs> and I realized what he was saying is that you got to get the teachings so you can put it down. Get the teachings from the story and then put it down. Um, walk out of the village. Go find a new story. <clears throat> so this... Uh, the gift um, that resides within each of us requires us uh, to drop those old stories, um, the old maps that we've relied on so uh, sometimes desperately in our lives, so those old maps that we've clinged to, um, all of a sudden are of no use. They're not very helpful anymore. And we must learn to, to navigate once again by the stars. Uh, in the dark. And um, Joanna Macy, uh, recent, well, not recently, but I heard her say one time, uh, she was, she, I think she was quoting something that Carl Gustav Jung had said, but she said that, you know, every, every life uh, carries within it one great question. And if you can find that question, and live your life into the question, then you will often deliver the medicine that you came here to deliver. Um, she said that the, the place where, um, the way I like to say it, when you, when you go to the horizon of your own imagination, um, the place that's not stabilized or grounded by a, a familiar set of, uh, of beliefs and well-established understandings. Like you've already passed that territory. You're out beyond the beliefs. You're on, you're on un, unknown ground. Um, it's in those places of, of uh, uncertainty that your creativity becomes most alive. It's not going to become alive while you're sitting back in, those, back in, the, in the old village of certainty. 
and the old set of beliefs uh, that have served you. It's important to think of your beliefs like tools. If they are useful, use them. If they're not useful, put them down and find a new tool. Um, because we use our beliefs to, to cage ourselves and, and, and out of our beliefs we create stories um, about ourselves or other people and, and it's, the, it's the thing that will uh, kill that imaginative spirit. Um, also kills the energy between two people. When you trap somebody in a story and you think you know them um, and it's a, a practice uh, share with people sometimes is practice looking at yourself one time in the mirror without any story. You have no idea who you're looking at. And you might be surprised at who shows up in the mirror. It, it can be startling. You might, you might not even recognize them. They might even not be from this time. Uh, but also do that with your loved ones, with your partners. If you look at them once again as if you've never seen them before, and then all of a sudden let yourself be surprised by what you can all of a sudden see, um, having dropped that old story. So the gift is, is beneath this, this uh, remembering and healing and belonging. Um, and uh, knowing that you, uh, and the gift is sometimes wrapped in, in, in things you have to kind of uh, unwrap it um, and, and get closer into it to really discern what it is. Uh, it begins with what is the thing you most love to do? And maybe how you frame that in your mind is the outer wrapping. And so, well, getting closer, what is that thing? Um, and uh, that, that you most love that really inspires and calls you. Um, that's what we call your area, that's your genius. Your, your, and what genius comes from the word genie. And so it means that we're all born with a genie uh, that carries this genius within us. And so you want to you want to get close to what is what is your genius? What is that that thing uh, that you most love doing? Even if it doesn't make sense, even if you got, even if you say, well, I, I really like uh, talking with people. So we'll get in closer. You know what does that mean? And you start to unwrap and discover more of that. Um, but these kind of things happen on on these initiatory passages. You have to. Eliminate the common distractions of life and, and uh, go into a place where you're um, not impacted by other people's mythologies. I like to say, if you if you're not initiated into the bone memory into the mythology of your own life, you will likely be living an existence that's not entirely your own. And the life you know you must live is the one standing a few paces in front of you, looking back over its shoulder with wide eyes waiting for you to remember. Who are you? It says. Where are you? Pay attention. Pay attention. Do not walk in the world in such a way that you allow another to give you a name you have no belonging to. Pay attention, pay attention. Do not walk in the world in such a way that you allow others to give you a name you have no belonging to. So some, uh, within our conversation tonight, a few rituals of, of, that you can take and uh, begin to unwrap and, and find the gift. Um, and I will tell you, it, it's, it's in the, it's, um, In that uh, first story that I was sharing with you about sitting with the old medicine man or old medicine woman, and I said, you listen into your story of dispiritedness, and they would say, you know, they would consider it could be one of these four things going on that would require one of four remedies. And they would ask you four questions. So we'll end tonight with the first of the four questions. When in your life did you stop singing? 
because where you stop singing in your life is where you began to disconnect from speaking your truth, from walking that truth. In Africa, they say, if you can talk, you can sing, and if you can sing, you can tell the truth. When in your life did you stop singing? The next question the old medicine man or old medicine woman might ask you is, when in your life did you stop dancing? Because where you stop dancing in your life is where you began to disconnect from your body. And the, and the ancestral wisdom of your lineage that your body carries. The old ones say, if you want to remember who you are, you got to rattle those bones. You got to do some dancing, moving around. They say, if you, if you stay connected to the four bones, these four bones in your body, you don't have to worry about anything. So you stay connected to your backbone, to your courage. As I like to say, the, the courage to stand up and speak when that's what courage looks like. And the courage to sit down and be silent when that's what courage looks like. Stay connected to your courage. Stay connected to your wishbone, to your dreams, to your visions. Be very intentional about what you are dreaming into your life. Be mindful of your thoughts because those are your prayers. Don't be reckless with your thoughts and your dreaming. Be mindful of your thoughts for those are your prayers. So stay connected to your dreams. Stay connected to your funny bone, <laughs> to your sense of humor, particularly the ability to laugh at your own controlled folly. <laughs> they say it's a, a power greater than everything to be able to laugh at ourselves. My uh, teacher, Rocking Bear, would always we had this running thing when he would start laughing he would just simply say he said i'm not laughing with you <laughs> and uh don't take yourself so seriously and be mindful that uh this uh not being connected to your funny bone has a lot of disguises uh, the, one of the primary disguises of that dilemma is, uh, is seriousness. Um, and seriousness has a lot of disguises um, called self-importance. Sometimes self-importance looks like stories of grandiosity or really important stories of how um, we argue for our own victimness. So stay connected to that funny bone and the ability to laugh at, laugh at ourselves. And that final bone is stay connected to that little bone, that little hollow bone that whispers with the, the echoes and the voices of, of spirit, of ancestors. And uh, you know when it's, when it's coming through that, those channels because it, it, it's, uh, we, we call it inspiration. That's the word we have for when Spirit's talking to us. We say, oh, that's inspiration. Um, but that's when, the, that's when this, the ancestors and Spirits are trying to get a message to us. Um, so stay connected to that little hollow bone. And then the third question this old medicine man or old medicine woman might ask you is when in your life When in your life when in your life did you become uncomfortable with the sweet territory of silence? And do, do you like the company you keep in those moments? We know that uh, certainly all the modern sacred traditions that exist on the planet began with somebody severing from their old life, going into the wilderness, into nature, on a mountain, in the desert, and fasting and praying and listening and sitting in silence. 
So all of the modern renowned sacred traditions of the world began with somebody going out into the wilds and sitting in silence. And then finally, when in your life did you become disenchanted with stories? And what are the stories that you liked as a child? What are the stories that, uh, that you like now, that you share with your friends? And to remember that stories are living and breathing entities. They're not meant to be fixed constructs of meaning that you, once you've heard it, you got it. They're meant to, to be in relationship with them, meaning that you can hear, uh, many of you on this, uh, out there that have heard that story of singing stone, lots of times you already know to ask those questions, you know, where in the story did I stop and pause? And the story kept going on, but I didn't hear it because I stayed there. Or where in the story uh, did I uh, leave the story and go somewhere else into my own story? And what was happening there when I left? And where did I go? And, uh, and where in the story, for some reason I'm forgetting the, the third place. Maybe one of you out there that knows this can remember for me. The places we stop in the story, the place we leave in the story. Oh, the place we enter the story. So when I told that story earlier, you may have noticed that um, I may have been into the story a minute or two and you weren't really there yet. And then you heard something about a circle of warriors or grandmothers or grunting and screaming. All of a sudden, boom, you're in. You're in the story. Something right there reached out and grabbed you and pulled you in. We say these are the places and medicine stories that have the most medicine for you in those moments. So stories are about relationship, not about knowing the outcome. It's about what, what calls to you in the story at that, when you hear it that time. Um, and the same is true for our own stories. So those four questions. When in your life did you stop singing? When in your life did you stop dancing? When in your life did you become uncomfortable with that sweet territory of silence? And when did you become disenchanted with stories? And these are the places you have to go back and, and connect with that one in that place, in that time, and, and get them out of there and teach them to sing and dance and tell stories and sit in the woods again. Um, so we're going to uh, close out our evening. Um, uh, and this is coming to me just in the moment with uh, a spontaneous offering of gratitude. So in order to do this with 41 people, not everybody has to offer a gratitude. Um, but uh, I think everybody's on, on mute. Um, if you have a gratitude, just click your... Uh, Pause to make sure the only one, so we can maybe do this without some kind of way of structuring it. But just click off your mic and speak a brief gratitude. Um, and we'll just let a few of those filter out into, the, into our recording here. Anything that, uh, that you may have been, you have remembered this night um, that can be helpful. So any, any gratitudes at all. Um, I just want to say, uh, if you can hear me, okay, um, so much gratitude for the space and spaces like this that, uh, you know, in our modern culture, we don't have so much connection in a ritual, spiritual way. And I'm just grateful to have found this group and to have heard your story and um, to have heard your words. So thank you for helping me feel less alone. You are most welcome. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you for community, be it this community or family or the community of uh, just a random meeting with someone in the grocery store, mm -hmm. just a connection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for being with us tonight, Libby. Thank you.
Gratitude for life. I'm grateful for the stories coming alive. Hi, Zoe. I care. <laughs> I'm grateful for eagle, coyote, bear, and buffalo, mm. and for storytellers. Mm. Thank you, Ashley. I'm grateful for this whole. I'm grateful for the drum. Tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Bev. I heard somebody else speaking, but their voice was kind of muted. Anyone else? I'm grateful for the traditions that have so beautifully taught you so that you can bring that to us. Mm. Mm. You're most welcome, Rosemary. Thanks for being here. <clears throat> I'm grateful for the ways in which you've helped me find my way home. Mm. Glad you're here, Bill. This is Deanna. I'm on the phone, but I'm grateful for all my grandmothers, my divine feminine grandmothers who have been talking to me and guiding me and leading me. Thank you. And this beautiful water, earth, and sky holding me. Yeah. You're most welcome to be in with us. All right. A couple of more, and we'll close out our evening. Gratitude. For our gratitude for remembrance of our oneness and our interconnectedness. Thank you, Deborah. Okay. So, thank all of you for joining us tonight. And um, if you enjoyed uh, this particular gathering. Um, I just posted in the chat box our um, website. And if you go there and click on the tab that says what we do, and then there's a thing called Fireside Inspirations. It's our blog page. And so there are many, many uh, stories and recordings and interviews and things like that, and writings that are there. Um, uh, free for you to enjoy. Um, and then we also have a, there's a Rites of Passage Council YouTube page that if, uh, I think that has probably all the um, recordings and interviews and things that have been done over the years. So you can find a lot there, a lot of fun stuff to listen to um, with both with myself and other um, Rites of Passage uh, guides that had made offerings. Um, and uh, so this year, um, coming up in 2022, um, I just want to say we also have a, a new program that four, speaking of women, four of the female guides of Rites of Passage Council um, have put together um, a program called the uh, Seasons of Womanhood that looks at the 13 archetypes of the feminine. And there's a, um, a six-week online uh, exploration that begins in February and that's followed up by a weekend uh, ritual gathering and um, later in the spring and then later in the summer is followed up by a, a prayer fast um, and you don't have to do all three you can do any part of it but I'm really grateful for the for the four women that have come together and really put together that new offering and um, and then we'll be having um, three other uh, vision quest ceremonies this coming year in uh, May, April, and August. Um, and an ancestor grief ritual, I think in June or July, sometimes I forget my own schedule, but it's all on the website. And then um, as far as overseas stuff, um, nothing firm yet, but we're, we're um, likely we'll be in um, uh, the UK somewhere. Um, we're putting together um, a large men's gathering that will be happening over there and may do one over here too. So 
stuff that there are some things that are not actually out there yet. And lots of these. We have um, some more of these that are coming up. Um, so tune in. You can find access to all of that from the website as far as all these online events like this. So blessings and gratitude to all of you for being here with us. And I uh, hope you all have a, a, a wonderful evening. And, uh, Thank as Buffalo you. said, go Thank well. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kater. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Aho, everyone. Aho. 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 Thank you. Good job. Good job. Thanks, Zoe. <laughs> that was great, Kater. Yeah, it was fun. Fun. This That's is what right. we did during the wintertime. We just kind of. Yeah, <laughs> it's easier.